You're listening to Romancing in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. Hello, and welcome to the Romancing in Paris podcast. I'm your host, Lily Heisey. In this podcast, we'll be traveling around the city as I pick out my top romantic spots per arrondissement. You don't have to visit these places only as a couple. Exploring them can be the expression of your own love of Paris. Are you ready to get romancing in Paris? In this episode of the podcast, we return to the second arrondissement of Paris. Ah, the second. The smallest of the city's 20 districts. It might be small in size, but it's mightily packed with romantic spots. A number of these are passageways, which I love. But since we covered one of these, the Gallery Vivian, in the first round of our tour of the most romantic spots in each district, I thought we would do something a little different for this episode. The district also has a great concentration of romantic restaurants, but after doing a little digging, I didn't find an exciting enough of a backstory for any of them. Two of my other top romantic spots are very near the Gallery Vivian, so I thought I could sprinkle them in later episodes. Given these various constraints, I came to the conclusion that we could visit one of my favorite, lesser-known spots in the area, an enchanting venue which takes us back to the grand era of La Belle Époque, a magical jewel-box theatre, so beautiful it can take your breath away. Grab your sherry, and perhaps your pearls or top hat. We're going to the Opera Comique. I remember when I first stumbled upon L'Opera Comique by accident many moons ago. It was likely when I was doing some occasional work for a small publishing house located nearby. Rounding a bend and coming into the tiny place Beaulieu Dieu, I was instantly struck by the elegance and was intrigued by this opulent theatre, which looks like it was delicately set within the midst of density blocks around the bourse, almost like it was photoshopped in or squeezed onto a giant Lego cityscape. Although the heritage of the Opera Comique institution isn't as old as the Opera de Paris, it's still quite fascinating and includes some romance so I thought we could cover these before arriving at the theatre itself. Readers of my book There's Only One Paris Tales for Our Times may recall that in the chapter on the Opera Garnier, we learnt that although Paris's opera house dates to 1875, the institution was founded a few centuries before, in 1669 and by Louis XIV. It was housed in a few different places before the arrival of Garnier's extravagant building. Actually, the opera comique's history is quite similar. Shortly after the Opera de Paris was created, two other theatrical structures were founded, the Comédie Française, think Molière, and the Comédie Italienne, which performed the Italian theatre style of La Commedia dell'arte. At the times, comedie was not used to signify that it was a funny type of play, but it was instead used to signify any theatrical play. Like today, in French, an actor is often called un comédien, and a comedian is a comic. Back then, the Comédie Italienne was supported by the king. There was a distinction made between what was considered legitimate theatre, 
performed in royally sanctioned theaters, and more low-brow street theater, which did not undergo the same scrutiny of royal censors. Up to 1645, Comédie Italienne was performed in the Hôtel de Bourgogne, a theatre built in 1548 on the land of the Dukes of Burgundy, now found a little further in the east of the second district, and constructed for the first authorised theatre troupe in Paris, the Confrérie de la Passion, a name which might ring a bell to some listeners, as this troupe came up in episode two of my other podcast, Paris Cachet. In 1660, the Comédie Italienne moved to the Theatre of the Palais Royal, where they performed in alternation with the troupe of Molière, which became the Comédie Française by a royal decree of Louis XIV in 1680. In the early 1700s, a new sort of theatre production was born out of the large seasonal fairs which took place in Paris, that of Saint-Germain and of Saint-Laurent, a type of lowbrow theatre mentioned earlier on. In 1714, a new troupe was officially founded by a certain Catherine Baron and Gautier de saint adam and it was called the Opera Comique. Not necessarily because it was funny, although some plays were, but because it was a hybrid, a mix of speaking and singing, contrary to traditional opera, which was entirely sung. The first Opera Comique was called Telemonk, and was a parody of the tragic opera Telemonk ou Calypso, in English, Telemonk in Calypso Island, performed at the Saint-Germain Fair, it was a huge hit. The popularity of this new form of theatre continued to soar. In 1762, the Comédie Italienne merged with the Opera Comique. The latter's name won out. However, the joint troupe moved into the Comédie Italienne's venue of l'Hôtel de Bourgogne. The Opera Comique also earned the status of royal theatre, which meant the troupe could perform in front of the French court. Oh la la! From the stages of fairgrounds to those of the royal palaces, not bad social climbing for the opera comique in less than 50 years. It was around this time that an important figure, or should I say figures, of the genre came to the foreground. Monsieur et Madame Fauvard. The son of a baker, Charles Simon Fauvard, was born in 1710. After his father's early death, when Charles was a young man, he needed to help support his mother, so he took to playwriting and had his first work performed at age 24. Shortly afterwards, Fauvard began working for the Opera Comique and began directing plays while continuing to write. It was in the next decade, when Charles was 35, that he met... Marie Justine Benoit Duranceré, a beautiful young dancer, singer, and actress. Born in 1727, Justine was the daughter of two French musicians working for the King of Poland. Given their position, Justine received a good education under the protection of the king. She learned to dance, to play music, and was schooled on literature. In 1744, her mother took some leave to return to Paris and took Justine with her. During their stay, Justine performed at the Saint-Laurent Fair under the pseudonym of Madame Chantilly. Quickly spotted by Charles Simon, they were married the following year. A theatrical dream team. They would collaborate together as either director and actor or co-writing plays together for the next decades. 
Their combined talents made the opera comique more and more successful, which sparked the jealousy of the Comédie Française, who arranged to have its rival closed down. Uh-oh. Jobless, the Fauvard went to work for Maurice, the Count of Saxony, as the director of a troop who accompanied and entertained the Count's armies in Flanders. Another wild success, the enemy forces requested that their soldiers could also be entertained by the troop as well. Unusual wartime policies, but not an unpleasant one. Better exchanging laughter than cannonballs. The Count also made Fauvard the director of the Théâtre de la Monnaie in Brussels, a title which he held from 1746 to 48. However, there was a slight glitch in all of this war of laughs. The Count fell for the alluring Madame Fauvard, who had to flee to Paris to escape the Count's unwanted attention. He then tried to set her up in a house on Rue Vaugirard, but an unwilling mistress, Madame Fauvard, was arrested by the Count and locked up in a convent. He then turned his anger towards Monsieur Fauvard, who was issued a lettre de cachet against him, sort of like an arrest warrant. To dodge this, Fauvard hid out in a cellar in a village near Strasbourg. He stayed there until the Count's death in 1750. The poor Fauvars. You would think that the whole episode would have made for a great plotline for one of their plays, however. Free of the threats of the Count, the troupe was rebuilt in the early 1750s and picked back up their performances, this time at the St. Laurent Fair. A few years later, they had a permanent theatre space once again, and the company thrived. By the mid-1760s, the troupe was back performing in front of the court. The Fauvars co-wrote several plays together, and Justine's place in theatre history is marked in several ways. Namely, she was the first to adapt her costume to the character she was playing, which was not common before then. At Justine's premature death, at age 40 in 1772, Charles had these kind words for her. The talents she possessed were nothing in comparison to the qualities of her heart. Oh la la, it sounds like it was a true love story between the Fauvars. If you're enjoying this episode of Romancing in Paris, you may also like to tune in to our sister podcast, The Terroir Podcast, which explores French gastronomy. Romancing in Paris will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Romancing in Paris. Charles went on writing and directing the troupe, and in 1783, the Opera Comique had its own dedicated theatre, funded by the Duc de Choiseul. It was named La Salle Fauvard, after its director, and the prestigious inauguration was attended by Queen Marie Antoinette. This theatre had a whopping 1,100 seats. Not bad. Fauvard lived to the ripe age of 82, passing away in 1792 in the heat of the French Revolution. He wrote over 150 plays during his long career. His works also inspired his close friend and artist, François Boucher, who painted a number of works featuring Fauvard's characters, The Little Shepherd and The Shepherdess Lisette. Perhaps these were modelled after Justine? You can see this sort of painting by Boucher and other artists of the era at the Hotel de Soubise, the topic of episode 3 of the podcast. (music) 
Fortunately, the opera comique didn't die with Fauvard, although it did have some ups and downs. The original Salle Fauvard burnt down in 1838 and was rebuilt in the same site in 1840. This new era saw Hector Belioz's Faust and some romantic pieces like Charles Gounod's Romeo and Juliet, the French version of Mozart's Marriage of Figaro, and Georges Bizet's legendary work Carmen, which premiered at the Opera Comique in 1875. Flames were to engulf the poor Salle Fauvard yet again, this time in 1887, a fire which broke out during a performance of Mignon by Amboise Thomas, which sadly caused hundreds of victims. Thus, the Opera Comique temporarily moved to the Châtelet Theatre while a new building was being constructed, its current home. It was designed by Louis Bernier and inaugurated in 1898, a ceremony attended this time not by a royal, but instead by President Felix Fowle. Although the theatre did well in its early days, as other forms of entertainment arrived, like the moving picture, theatre-going began to wane. This eventually led to the Opera Comique's closure in 1971. Fortunately, the building wasn't torn down, and instead it fell under the direction of the Paris Opera. It then was shifted to the control of the National Theatre, and in more recent times it has been restored and given new life. A refurbished look and program In addition to more classic performances, the opera comique continues to innovative theatre, which might include electronic music instead of the past opera. I think it's time we pop by to visit it, don't you think? One would never guess, walking down the super busy Boulevard des Italiennes, nor the highly trafficated Rue du 4 Septembre, that there was a charming theatre hidden between the streets. As you come to the itsy bitsy Place Boisdieu, named after François Edrien Boisdieu, a prominent composer of music for opera comique, you'll be struck by the sumptuous facade of the small opera house. Top artists and artisans of the times were hired to create this extravagant new building, a true jewel of la belle époque. The columned facade has six caryatide figures, as well as allegories for music and poetry. The interiors are even more elaborate, especially the vestibule Bois Dieu, which overlooks the square. It's decorated with a mural of famed opera comics, Carmen and Manon. More allegorical murals are painted throughout, as well as busts of certain composers and other elaborate craftsmanship. The auditorium is equally intricate and draped in red velour. It originally had 1,500 seats, but these have been reduced to 1,200 today. A few years ago, I was fortunate enough to have a behind-the-scenes tour of the Opera Comique, which included the backstage area. This is how I really fell in love with this special theatre. You can visit the interiors by attending a performance, which could be a nice idea for a full romantic outing, including the Opera Comique. What's nice is that they are trying to make the opera comique format more accessible to modern audiences. 45 minutes before a performance, the playwright or director gives a 15-minute introduction to the play, so you'll be able to put it into context. There are also sometimes surtitles during the performance in French so that the audience knows what the performers are singing or saying. It's an enchanting place, even if you don't attend a performance. 
and it offers a more intimate romantic experience than the nearby busier Opera Garnier, although it is also splendid. One of the loveliest secret places in the second district. You will surely surprise your sherry by passing by it. And it's the perfect place to spend a quiet moment or steal a kiss. This wraps up season two of the podcast. We hope you enjoyed this second season. Feel free to email us if there are any specific themes or sites you would like us to cover in the next season. If you're enjoying the podcast, please rate or review it. It only takes a few moments and it's extremely helpful for attracting potential new listeners. If you would like to support the network, please see our new Patreon page, which includes fantastic extras for members. Until next time, happy romancing in Paris. This episode of Romancing in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.